and good morning everybody to our second symposium session as part of Ensonic 2018 Algorithmic Spaces. In, during this session um, there will be four presentations. This session was put together by our co-curators Hans Holger Rutz and David Pirro. They are hailing from the research project Algorithms That Matter which settles at the IEM Graz. So, Starting, there will be Tom Matt. Tom Matt is a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, a musician and creative programmer, and today he will talk um, about interacting with nonlinear dynamical agents. So the field is open to you. Thank thanks. you very much. Thanks, and yeah, thanks for putting this together, and, and thanks to uh, Hans and David for sorting all this out um, in this program today. And yeah, it was a really nice concert yesterday. Um, and I'm, I'm primarily going to be talking about my contribution to that concert yesterday. Um, for those that missed it, I'll give a really quick flavor just by kind of showing the software I used and the kind of sounds it made. Um, but it's really an exploration of a very particular synthesis process that I kind of put together um, to help me explore kind of particular processes sonically. Um, and in some ways, it's going to feel quite separate to some of the discussion yesterday, I think, which was focused quite a lot around AI and discussions of AI. And this, this in some ways feels like a different territory, you know, maybe kind of that split off from cybernetics and took a different path. Um, but I'm going to try and kind of uh, intersect slightly with that discussion um, and try and view this talk a little bit as a different perspective on creativity and algorithms and how algorithms are leveraged um, for creative ends um, and it takes quite a broad view of algorithms where I, I kind of I've come to see like a violin as a specific algorithm for music you know it has specific pathways it has specific kind of behaviors that dictate the way a sound develops and moves and changes that can be kind of structured by a performer in some way but the violin itself contributes significantly to that and is a really kind of uh, sort of specific project. And yeah, particularly with something like an improvised violin performance, there's no disrespect to the performers, but it's, you know, they, they share a lot in common in terms of what they do sonically. Particularly if you're particularly interested in timbre, you know, there's, a, there's kind of a, a set space that they can explore um, in, in their performance with a violin. Um, and a set history they can explore and kind of cultural resonances of that instrument. Um, so I'll give some quick background on myself, um, kind of show just very briefly a nod to some other previous projects around algorithms, and then kind of come back to this specific project and show to some extent the nuts and bolts of that, which hopefully will help a conversation about uh, the nature of algorithms and creative processes with algorithms. Um, so yes, as Yannick said, I'm, I'm a researcher and lecturer at the University of Edinburgh since the last sort of year, since I moved up there from Goldsmiths. And I have a background in, um, yeah, computer music performance and trying to kind of work with computers live in an improvised fashion. So for a long time, I, I kind of went to Eddie Prevost's workshop, who is um, an improviser from the group AMM. Um, who's been running this regular workshop that takes improvisers and, and kind of gives them a space to explore their instruments quite thoroughly. Um, so I have that kind of aspect to my background and that really informs what I do with software to try and create musical processes. Um, the, the other kind of main strand is maybe as an HCI researcher, which is human computer interaction. So really looking at, at ways of um, the relationships with the computer particularly in a kind of real-time fashion. Um, so yeah, so today, it, like I say, it's focused on this specific synthesis project, but just to kind of give brief insight into some other previous algorithmic projects. This was uh, an installation from 2014 that um, was essentially just kind of fixed audio. I, I, I rarely create installations that have a physical presence. Um, and I don't know how much the image conveys it, but. I was quite pleased with the image at the time. It was this sort of like a brain plugged into Wikipedia that would just kind of regurgitate Wikipedia uh, as if it was having a conversation with you. Um, but it would just kind of spout this text. 
that it was kind of presenting as its own knowledge and its own kind of, oh, like, I was reading about this thing the other day and, you know, it said this and this and it would just kind of endlessly present stuff from Wikipedia. And it would find a link on a particular Wikipedia page, follow that link, and then start talking about the next topic, and then the next topic, and go endlessly, as if it was having a conversation with you, but basically just forcing its facts on you. Um, which was sort of an exploration of just kind of the connectivity of Wikipedia in a kind of playful way. Um, slightly more recently, two projects that are connected and kind of try to explore the specific nature of, of kind of computer algorithms for music and to slightly raise awareness of what's under the hood in any given music technology. So the first was Control, which was an installation in a gallery where there was just a single dial in the gallery. And people could come into the gallery and were encouraged to you know, turn the knob and that would make sound through a speaker in some way um, once they turned it. Um, and that was all they could see, you know, just this black box with a dial attached to it. But behind the scenes, I'd ask 22 different artists all to contribute a specific bit of software, this kind of specific algorithm for relating that dial to sound in some way. And if it was left alone for more than, say, five seconds, it would sort of turn off and in the background switch to a different artist's work. So it's kind of this, this black box thing. And it was trying to, you know, the, the name itself is supposed to be playful of that. You know, the people would come into the gallery, they'd use it, they'd control it, but really they'd be really locked into whatever the specific artist had given them or enabled them to do with that specific bit of software. And partly also to highlight the kind of complexity of authorship in something like that. You know, they were the ones, they sort of ostensibly had the agency. They could turn the dial, make sounds. It was their sound that they were creating, but they were so heavily shoehorned into different directions by the nature of the algorithms that were underlying it. And some were very explicit attempts to make instruments. So, you know, try and really create a rich world out of that single dial. Whereas some were much more kind of uh, playful things that were almost very limiting or forced you to even play through a composition. So every time you turn the dial to the right, say it triggers the next step in a particular piece. And then if you hit the left side, it triggers the next step. And so you were kind of forced into a really linear piece, even though you were kind of put in control of when that happens. So it was trying to kind of highlight the complexity of authorship and agency in inside music technologies. Um, and then the kind of sister project to that was a live performance along similar lines, where this time it was a set of 20 super collider patches that I made uh, that I'd perform with, uh, but only one at a time. But the audience had a button they could press, and at any point, if they hit it, it would just sort of throw away my current super collider patch and give me a different one. And so I'd have basically, you know, my instrument taken away from me and someone giving me a different instrument. Um, again, to kind of try and kind of performatize the, 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 the kind of restrictions and affordances of each of the systems, which again were quite locked down and often quite playful themselves. Uh, so that's just a kind of couple of background projects. Um, so the one today is, like I said, this piece yesterday which is a project that's been going on for a few years now, um, but that was finally released this year on CD as Gutter Synthesis on the OnTrack label. Um, and like I say, it's based around this specific synthesis method that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it's available to download, I should say. I can maybe make that link more accessible somewhere, or you can ask me afterwards and I can point you at it. Um, so you can, you know, the software I used last night, you can kind of try out yourself. and. For me, that's a kind of interesting part of the project too. It's how much it is this a program I've built that just does things, you know, like does it just do the same thing every time or if someone else uses it, does it do something different? So if anyone else wants to have a go with it, that'd be kind of interesting to hear how you get on with it. Um, yeah, if you don't get down the link in time, you can probably just Google Tom Mudd uh, gutter and navigate there somewhere. It's, it's a max patch and it's a standalone. Um, I'll just let you write that down. Okay, so yeah, and so backing up slightly to the background to this. So it really comes out of my experience improvising. So I, I, I never really did improvisation with acoustic instruments, but I was around a lot of people who did. And I think I probably tried to ape their method for interacting with their objects in software. And so this is Eddie Prevo, who ran the workshop that I mentioned. Um, 
which has been running since 1999, and has an explicit focus on exploring your materials and, and in a kind of fairly relaxed way. Um, and you can see Eddie there doing something he, he's done probably hundreds, if not thousands of times before, um, which is bow a cymbal onto a drum skin, um, which is, is kind of assemblage of fairly simple objects, but it has enormous kind of complexity in a lot of ways. So, I mean, the bowed cymbal itself is, is an incredibly versatile instrument. You know, you can really kind of govern the harmonics and, and pull different frequencies out of the cymbal. And the cymbal is a chaotic object itself. Um, but when it's combined with the resonance of the drum skin and the different places on the drum, it becomes a really kind of flexible system. I'll just play a little clip of him doing something that's not exactly like that because I couldn't find a video of it, but related. So it's only a very short clip. So just a very short clip, but you kind of get the idea slightly of, of possibly some of the potential of that kind of a setup. So here he's even bowing it onto another symbol on the drum, and it's an even more kind of intricate assemblage of different pieces that all kind of contribute to each other. Um, um, and that's kind of significant. You know, it's not like the symbol makes a sound and resonates to the drum and that's it. The drum kind of responds and, and kind of affects how the symbol resonates as well. The tightness of the skin, kind of applying different pressures to the symbol and damping it in different ways, which enable some frequencies and stop others. And so I think that's partly why it's been a system he's been able to explore for such a long period. You know, he's, he's I, I'm not sure when he started exploring that technique, but certainly I would say since the 80s and, and still is happy to, to go there and try and find things there that he hasn't found there before. Um, and I think partly it's, it, it's not a system that's completely controllable. You're going to be slightly governed just by the nature of what happens. It's not going to be something where you go, I want that frequency, then this frequency, then that frequency. You have to kind of go slightly with the object and, and follow where it's up to. It has a state because it's resonating in a particular mode, and when it's resonating in that mode, that has certain affordances. Um, and that's the kind of interaction that I think I wanted to kind of get to in a computer system, this, this state dependency, where what you do really depends on what's going on with the system in some way. Um, I'll play one more example, which is um, a piece by the composer John Lely. So this is not an improvisation, but he's, he's a composer who has done a lot of improvisation, um, but it's also composed slightly in the Vondelweiser kind of vein. Um, and this is a piece from, I think, 2006, so it's quite an old one. Um, and it's really simple in a way. It just takes any string instrument and you bow it lightly and move your finger very slowly without putting pressure on from one end of the string to the other. And that's the piece, you know, when you get to the end, you're finished. So double bass or cello or violin, same kind of piece. Um, and so it's very simple, but what comes out is kind of very complex. So I'll play a little clip of that. Where are we? So this is for cello.
So, I mean, it's, it's kind of 12 minute recordings, I won't play all of it, but uh, yeah, there's kind of two things I think that's useful for in this context. So one, it's, it's, a, it's a completely linear process. You know, the performer ostensibly doesn't do a lot. They move from A to B, bowing continuously, and everything that emerges is, is part of the complexity of the, of the bowed string and that interaction. And it, it really feels like it's sounding the algorithm in, in quite a direct way and in a, in a kind of hands-off way where you get the richness without having to sort of perform it in any completely complex way. But this whole harmonic pattern, as you can hear, is kind of emerging through the, the sort of harmonics. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that, like the bowed symbol, it has that time dependence still. So it, it's in a particular state and the way it responds to what you do still depends on the state it's in, which isn't as obvious, I don't think, in a bowed string as is in something like a cymbal or, or a big tam-tam or something, or, or feedback with a microphone. Um, you know, those systems, it's kind of clear there's a state, the string, it's not so obvious, but it, it has a tendency to try and, you know, if a particular harmonic is sounding, that harmonic, it, it kind of self-reinforces slightly, like feedback. And so you could put your finger on the string and bow in a particular place, and you might get a different response than if you had kind of approached that from a different harmonic. It might be more inclined to stay in that harmonic. Um, so yeah, so what has all that got to do with what I'm talking about? <laughs> um, so this is a quote from John Lely, and it's actually from the sleeve notes for an Eddie Provo album, a uh, solo album. Um, and it kind of gets at things I'm interested in, in, in creating algorithms for computer music. So there's a discernible area of music concerned with actively finding and revealing hidden resources of materials at hand. And practitioners from a wide range of disciplines are converging on this common ground, where the previously clear boundaries of composition and improvisation lose their definition. Um, yeah, so it's that hidden resources, I think, is really interesting. And this is, you know, this is, feels like it's in a kind of long tradition that came up slightly yesterday of the kind of post cajun backing off from the, from the, the kind of um, your own agency slightly and letting things do their thing. It has resonances in that, I think. You know, you, you don't create the material, you kind of find the material in some sense. Um, which, like, to try and link that slightly to yesterday, has echoes in what we were talking about in AI. You know, you, you, you kind of, um, if you try and work with um, AI, um, like, uh, I, f I forget who the name of the speaker was, but they framed it as man versus machine. And my view of kind of working with computer music systems is more like this. You know, you set up a situation and things come out of that. and. You know, you don't want to have to fight the agency of the AI, you know, you can happily let that do everything and, and sort of back off and say, look at what emerged um, and not be kind of bound up in, in the agency of that. Um, so, yeah, so moving on to the synthesis thing and how I try and do that hidden affordances thing. So it, it's using kind of nonlinear dynamical systems, which is obviously in the title, and that's the kind of aspect of the acoustic instruments that I think is fundamental to them being explorable like that. It's not the only thing, but I think it's a big part of, of what's going on in something like the bowed symbol, its interaction with the drum skin um, and the bowed string. Uh, it's that combination of a feedback loop with a nonlinear element um, that gives you this explorable terrain. And so the, the starting point for the synthesis algorithm is uh, what's called the damped force duffing oscillator, which is a fairly well understood nonlinear dynamical system. You know, it's it's in the kind of list of examples you tend to get shown if you start exploring that topic, along with things like the Lorentz attractor and the logistic map. Those kind of systems. It, it, it's not a kind of really niche one. It, it's one of the more well understood ones, and this is a chart of how the behavior of that system varies as you change two parameters. So um, I don't think that was originally intended as a kind of real-time map of how it responds, but um, Thompson and Stewart kind of explicitly present it as what it would be like to interact with this in real time and compare that with real physical systems. So uh, you've got kind of K and B on the Y and X axes. And if you imagine they're two dials or something like that, which they very literally were in the performance yesterday, 
the map there shows different kinds of behaviors in different regions. Um, and so you can see it's a really like complicated picture. You know, you could set B to a particular setting and then vary K and you'd move through so many different regions at sort of very unpredictable times. If you shift B slightly, you're going to hit those regions or very different regions at different points. Um, and some of those are kind of stable, some of them are more chaotic. Um, and even within those areas, there are multiple behaviors. This doesn't really uh, convey the complexity very well. And it doesn't convey the time dependence I mentioned before either. So that's just a kind of beginning of an insight into the complexity of the space of exploration of this process. Um, and I kind of have a mental model of it like this, where it's as if you're exploring a kind of landscape like this. And it's as if you're doing something like rolling a ball around that landscape. It kind of settles into particular areas and you can push it into other areas and, and each of those areas has different kind of behaviors for the way the ball's going to move. And you can kind of push and pull. And that's kind of analogous to the behavior of trajectories in the nonlinear dynamical system and their behavior relevant, relative to different attractors in the system. Um, I'm not going to kind of dig in too far on the maths in this, but just to show one example from an even more well-known system, the Lorentz attractor. So one example of interacting with this, so you probably you've seen this butterfly before, it, it gets to this point where it oscillates in kind of this slightly unpredictable chaotic way where it splits back and forth between these two loops. Um, and if you're controlling that in real time, one of the things you can do is if you kind of reduce the parameter rho below a certain threshold, if it's in this kind of state, you can get it to lock into one of the loops or the other. And it's, you know, which one it locks into depends what it was doing at the time. So there's a kind of interaction you can have with it where you can sort of push past the threshold where it starts to do this chaotic thing and then back off and it'll settle into one of the two states. And it gives you this affordance where you can hop between the two sides of the rent system. So you can kind of, if you're in the left one orbiting like that, you increase this threshold, this parameter until it hits the threshold where it goes back and forth, and then you drop out of that, and you can potentially have pushed it to the other side. Um, yes, and your parameter is back exactly where it was, but you're now on the other side. So you've got exactly the same input, but a completely different kind of state of the system. Um, yeah, and so I was going to kind of show the system now with that context, um, just to show those kinds of... Uh, affordances. So this is just a really simplified version of it. And let's just see how loud this is going to be. So this is not the system. This is an oscillator which obviously doesn't have those properties. If you set it to a specific setting, it's at that setting. It's just a sine tone frequency dial. Um, and this is a kind of one of the, the voices from the synthesis algorithm yesterday. So it runs 12 of these in the actual thing. Um, but just to kind of show how this varies with the dial. Let's make it a bit louder. So it hits all these points where it makes a, a kind of discontinuous jump. But it also, uh, I'll see if I can try and get it to do this thing. So I'm at 0 0.1710. I can push to a different harmonic. And then I might be able to unwind and come back where I was without losing this harmonic, maybe. Not quite on this one. Let's see if I can find a point. OK. 3510. Yeah, so I'm back at the same point, but with a higher harmonic, which is, may seem kind of trivial, but I think it's that kind of interaction which gives you a really kind of big space to explore. Um, and I mean, you can kind of hear it has slightly more of a kind of, you know, it sounds like a recorder maybe or something like that. It's, it's not a physical model. It's not in any way a simulation of those kind of acoustic systems, but it's, it's a lot like that in a way. It's not a deliberate simulation, but it, it has a lot of the same properties because that's a lot of the same kind of mechanisms in those instruments. 
Um, so, I mean, this is, you know, the state-of-the-art acoustic physical models. They don't have the Lorentz system, obviously, but they, they're kind of based on, sorry, one second. Um, yeah, this kind of a model where you have some nonlinear element, you have a linear element and a kind of feedback loop between the two. Um, the nonlinear element might be the nature of the bow and the bowed interaction. The linear part is the resonance of the string and the resonance of the string comes back and interacts with, with the bow mechanism and gives you that kind of same affordances as the system I just showed, which is a similar mechanism. So this is the actual kind of process in, one, in the oscillator I just showed. The, the, the thing at the top left is the duffing oscillator. That's the, the kind of um, differential equation for it. Um, and it, it's shoehorned into a filter bank at sample rate. So, you know, this might not be that interesting if you're not interested in synthesis, but that's the kind of nature of the process. Uh, so the oscillator at the top, if you run that on its own without the bandpass filters, it has this kind of chaotic aspect. It's really kind of raw and digital, but it still has certain resonances and will kind of sit on certain frequencies. But it, because it has those resonances, passing it through this bandpass filter bank means you get these odd conjunctions of the resonances of the duffing oscillator and the resonances of the bandpass filter bank. And that gives you this real kind of area to explore. Um, but what makes it more interesting than the performances? So last night there were 12 versions of that thing on the left playing. So you can see two coupled together here. Last night there were 12 coupled together. And you can kind of increase or decrease the amount to which one affects the other. Um, and you can kind of hear that behavior. They, they can kind of lock together. And I don't really understand exactly why they do the things they do. Um, I, I'll show the actual patch, I think, because you can kind of hear some of the behaviors there and you hear how the oscillators kind of, it's sort of entrainment, the way they come together and, and do the same thing. So, this is the patch you download. Let's just change the sound card. I'll set it up a bit more like it was last night. So this one comes with a set of eight of these oscillators. So I won't go into the controls particularly, but I'm just gonna try and show that kind of interaction between oscillators. So I'll turn the interaction off for the moment so they're kind of completely decoupled from each other. We'll just hear one in isolation. Let's just see what this sounds like. Try that. So that, this is a lot like oops, this is a lot like the one I was just showing the kind of single oscillator, which has different kind of behaviors and you know sounds like slightly, slightly instrumental potentially. So it's not like the most exciting instantiation of it. But let's see what happens. So here's a second one. So they're completely separate at the moment. They're not interacting. They have a modulation, so they're slightly evolving by themselves. But this is bringing up the degree to which they kind of inform each other. And they start to take on a real kind of life of their own. And they also seem to tend to fuse, even though they're being pushed through quite different filter sets. They kind of try and, and push each other into the same frequency bands, and each one kind of fights that. And if we try it with, say, the full set. So this is the eight independent oscillators not interacting. And if you push the interaction, so they're all now coupled together, they start to take on this so you unified voice slightly, but it, it never really settles.
partly because each is modulating slightly itself, but the way those modulations happen are no longer just kind of back and forth. As one goes past a certain point, it might take another with it completely. And there's this sort of ebb and flow. Um, so I should probably sum up, because I think I've just got a minute left. Um, but yeah, so like I say, this is available for download. And one of the kind of things I'm interested in is, is to try and see how this kind of uh, works if it's not me using it. You know, is it just me using it that makes it sound that way? Or if you use it, is it just going to sound like that? Could you have done a different performance last night? You know, and what are the kind of, does it have specific capacities and tendencies? Um, and how do they interact with different people's sort of musical perspective or sonic perspective? Um, yeah, so I think I should probably close on that, but maybe that's some of the potential conversation now or later. Yeah, so thanks. So thank you very much, Tom Mutt, for the insight you shared um, on your piece, Gutter Synthesis, which we could hear yesterday evening as part of the concert. So now um, I'm wondering whether there are some questions coming from the audience. Oh, please wait. Um, I will give you the microphone so that we can all hear you. Yeah, thank you. Could you refer to the plot with the blue screen? With the blue? Sorry, sir. The next one, the next, I get oh, the, the next one. The, uh, this plot. <laughs> no. no. No, with the blue. Uh, yeah, the yeah stop. Rats. Yeah, this one. Uh, I know this spot is it's like for what, what is. Uh, given by Carbonetics from Robert Wiener for Pendulum, by the way. And that's exactly the, 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 the response. And what I can't see any gap uh, or any advantage between that plot and the music you would generate with the system. It's typical for mechanical system and stability questions, stable or unstable. Sorry, I didn't quite follow the question. Yeah, my, my question is, what is the advantage to use methods uh, used in technical systems uh, for the question, is the st system stable or not stable? And it's, it's the phase space called in, in technical. Stability you mean uh, in the, oh, thanks. Me. <laughs> Stability in that this system can be potentially unstable. Yes. What's the advantage yeah. of using it's unstable? A, it's, this is an ex example for a system which is stable. Oh, okay. You mean it's and therefore, my question is: What is the, yeah, what is the advantage to use such techniques? Is it's Norbert Wiener's theory of the st st uh, carbonetics with regard to generate music or, uh, yeah, sound? I see not link between the question. Right. Well, I mean, yes. Maybe I should back up slightly. So, how this could possibly relate to the generation of sound? That's part of the question. Yeah, and yeah I, so, I see no... I see yeah, no. no, that's a really good point. I kind of glossed that. <laughs> um, so it, it's a kind of, it's, it's definitely something people have been doing for a while, which is to run this system and iterate it and have the, the, the kind of output bounded between zero and one and to literally apply the output of the system in one axis yeah. as sample values as audio. As sample values. Yeah, so you literally mm -hmm. kind of, yeah. you know, those oscillations could be the oscill like exactly like an oscillator. Yeah. So it, you it, take the it, it's, a, it, it's oscillator, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. you just run that at a rate at which yeah. you'll get some which kind of audible stable, output. Which is example for a stable one. Yeah, obviously if it goes off to infinity, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> this is stable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer the question? Okay. And the, okay. Thank you. Are there some more questions coming from the audience? Well, yesterday, uh, oh, over there is a question. Uh, just a, 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 a technical question, maybe. Uh, so I'm curious in the patch you presented in the very end, uh, my understanding is um, mildly uh, understanding how, how it would probably work. So uh, if all these uh, eight oscillators are coupled with each other, um, then you you need basically uh, spe special abstract special objects in because you said it was implemented with Max. Uh, 
So you need like these uh, um, single sample feedback yes. uh, circuits and so forth. So is, is basically do you have one object that represents the entirety of these oscillators, or, or how do you do that technically? There's, yeah, there's. Um, I probably can't go into the patch here, but there's yeah an, an external basically that I set up that is one of those voices. Uh, so the inter voice feedback is not single sample rate. In fact, there's a slight latency on that, which maybe helps <laughs> to have that kind of delay so that, yeah, it might couple too strongly and you wouldn't get the undulations as much. I haven't tested that, but that's a, that's a good point. Actually, no, I did. I tried one in Juice to try and make it as a plugin, um, and it didn't quite behave the same way where there was sample. I, I think I had to artificially put in the delay between the interaction between voices. So yesterday during your, during your concert, um, with how many uh, sliders did you actually interact? Uh, I had a kind of, it was a very small interface and I had these kind of global ones on the top left. So the damping of the system, the kind of modulation and the resonance of the filters and the gain of the primary things and that interaction, the amount they interact. And the thing that went slightly wrong was that uh, some of the things were badly configured at the start, but the idea was to bring in the voices separately and independent and then allow them to interact more and more as the piece went on, basically. Yeah. So do you build your um, devices yourself? Are these uh, customized interface solutions? The interface, I mean, the physical interface. Yes, yes the It's a really off-the-shelf MIDI controller. I mean, oh, okay. it's not even my MIDI controller. I borrowed that one for this. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I usually just do it with the software um, directly. Okay. Um, so the results were really interesting, seeing you um, interacting with these nonlinear dynamical agents, and the acoustic result was very breathtaking. So thank you very much, Tom Mutt. Thanks.